thank you for coming out tonight and being a part of this event, welcoming one of our own, one of our New York ELT community talents, Irene Schoenberg, that makes it especially sweet and pleasing that we've had such an amazing turnout. So that is, that's wonderful, and it speaks very loudly. Um, I'm Caitlin Morgan, the Director of English Language Studies here at the New School, and I am accompanied here tonight by my intrepid colleagues, Gabriel diaz Majoli and Leslie Painter-Ferrell, and Jackie Maffiori, manning the front. Um, and we are, as I mentioned, especially proud and pleased to have Irene here tonight to talk about something very practical, immediately applicable, uh, engaging multi-level English language learners in the communicative grammar classroom. Um, I also want to mention that Irene, it, being part of our community, has been a colleague and a mentor to quite a few of us in this room, including myself. And so, um, again, thank you for being here. It's wonderful for more people to get to know you and benefit from your um, ideas and insights. I want to thank Pearson Education and Rob Renner uh, from Pearson, our regional rep, and they are co-sponsoring tonight's event and have generously provided the refreshments and the terrific uh, book display table. We invite you to indulge in both of those things after Irene's talk tonight. So please take the time afterwards to talk to your colleagues, network, look at the wonderful materials that Rob has brought tonight. If you fill out a book order request tonight, he will send these to you free um, to your home. And so please take advantage of that offer. I also am holding the Certificate of Completion for Professional Development for those of you who need any documentation of attending tonight. So come find me afterwards uh, if you need one of these. Uh, and now, I'd like to welcome Gabriel Diaz Maggioli. He is the Dean of the newly founded School for Language Learning and Teaching here at the New School for Public Engagement and Chair of English Language Studies. Good evening, everybody. And this is like the more formal introduction. Uh, on behalf of the School of Language Learning and Teaching of the New School for Public Engagement, the New School University in New York City, welcome again. It's great to see familiar faces who have been with us in most of our public events. Uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. And if you are new to these events, we hope to see you come back as we do one of these per semester. Um, uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce somebody who is very well known to you, but I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story dating way back to when I was still living in Uruguay, and I would come to the States for the TESOL conference. And I met a group of ladies there who, when I was very young and naive, uh, actually taught me everything I had to learn about this English language teaching field. And it's my pleasure today to welcome one of my dearest, dearest friends, Irene Schoenberg, for, uh, to work with us tonight. I hope you enjoy the conference, and let's schmooze over the drinks and books afterwards. Irene, welcome. I'm really delighted to be here. As Caitlin knows, I've come to all these events because I've always felt this is such a beautiful venue. And most of all, because I get to meet people that I know or people that I meet that are in the same field. The early bird question was one I had asked a group of um, academic directors and teachers at a seminar last year. Um, and I thought that as I go through my talk, I would tell you what they wrote, and you can consider your own answers to the questions. Imagine you're observing an intermediate level grammar class. Um, what would you look for? What would be three features that would be very important for you? And what are a couple of things you wouldn't want to see in a grammar class? OK. Today, I'm going to talk about ways to engage strong and weak students simultaneously in a communicative grammar class. Don't take notes, because I've written an article, and many of the ideas are in the article. So I want you just to listen, and we'll work together, talk together. Part one will be how grammar teaching has evolved. 
And part two will be the actual activities that engage students in a grammar class. Okay. In 1969, Lewis Kelly wrote a book, 25 Centuries of Language Teaching. And in it he said, there's always been a cyclical evolution of ideas about language teaching. We discard old ideas only to bring them back with some modification. Would you agree? Yeah? Can you think of any technique, any approach, anything that we're doing today that we used to do, discarded, but brought back with modification? Did some, what? Phonics. Okay, in reading, absolutely in the schools, phonics was brought back, whole language phonics, yes. Drills. Okay, are we doing drills today? Yes, but what is the difference? Because I was thinking of that too. The audiolingual approach was one in which you would give the students some kind of sentence and they would uh, substitute words. If you look at any adult book today, adult book, I mean books for the uh, immigrants to the United States, they have a conversation, and the conversation has words that can be substituted. We don't call it drills, that word we don't use, but we actually say this is an effort to, de to develop fluency. So you have a conversation, you substitute something. Any other techniques or methods that we used to use, what? Oh, great. Yes. We used to give dictations, right? Everybody liked dictations, and I think they're still good because it allows you to see what, to listen and see how what you hear corresponds with the spelling. Today, one of the more popular um, uh, uh, techniques is the dictogloss. Do you know what a dictogloss is? A dictogloss is a passage in which a particular grammar um, pattern is inserted. Students will listen to it, and they will write down as much as they can. It's not a dictation because they're not listening and writing. However, it does involve trying to remember everything, use the grammar, or show that you understand the meaning of the grammar. So it very much combines the ideas of communicative learning with traditional dictations. OK, I'm sure that if. I ask you, and I'm elicit from you, you'll have a few other techniques that we used to use, discarded, and brought back with modification. But in my opinion, if you think about our field today, there are actually two features of the field that dominate what we do. One began about 30 years ago, and the other about 15 years ago. Um, talk to your neighbor and see if you'll come up with the two same ideas as I did. Okay, shh, 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 shh. I mean, this is nothing that I read somewhere. This is just my observation. I've been to a lot of conferences. I've heard a lot. Does anybody want to uh, tell us one of them, the one that began about 30 years ago? What changed our field really quite dramatically? Yeah, communicative language learning or the communicative approach. Okay, and then what is the second one? And this is not exactly an approach, but it's something that's truly changed what we're doing and how we're doing it. Student-centered? Student-centered is more part of communicative learning. So, yes, student-centered is the change, but there's something else I'm thinking. Yeah, I heard it. Technology, yes, yeah. Now, I always like to define a communicative approach because, unfortunately, the word is used sometimes to mean communication. But by a communicative approach, we actually mean an approach in which the teacher will set up some kind of lifelike 
authentic-like situation in which the students communicate meaningfully. So that, as a simple example, if you turn to your partner and say, do you have blue eyes, that's not communicative. But if you turn to your partner and say, do you like chocolate, it's communicative because there's an information gap. Okay. Um, any advantages? I'm sure you'll all know the advantages because you've heard it, you've used it, you know what they are. What's so great about communicative language learning, the communicative approach? It's meaningful. The students focus on what they're saying rather than simply the form. Other advantages to communicative language learning? They can use it outside the classroom. Of course, they'll use it outside the classroom. It's real. It's more real. It's more applicable. It's engaging. Exactly. It's engaging. It lowers barriers. Lowers barriers. It lowers the barrier. It's, yeah, it, 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 they're not worried about the form, and they're just saying what they want to. OK? They negotiate meanings and they're communicating. Exactly, because they really want to understand. They negotiate meaning. And it, it seems more like what they're aiming for. OK, you all know the advantages. You've read them. You've heard them. Focus on meaning, not form. Student-centered, not teacher-centered. Individual-paced learning, motivating. You've covered them all. OK. Training manuals don't talk about disadvantages. But as I said, it's how old? 30 years old? It's time for us to step back and say, well, are there any not so great features of communicative learning? In the back. OK. It's truly difficult to gauge how much they're learning when you use communicative learning. It might be difficult for a very shy person to get involved that way. OK. It, it, you know, it's interesting because I, I agree with you. I mean, just to add to that, it doesn't accommodate different learning styles. Yeah. OK. So OK. OK. okay. Yeah. It doesn't accommodate different learning styles. It assumes that the student will be comfortable with a student-centered approach. And not everybody is, OK? Uh, part of the communicative approach involves group work and pair work, which we all say is great because why? Why is it good? Because we're Americans. OK, OK. All right, students who are shy to speak up in class some of you might want to answer the questions, but you say, oh, I don't know. I hope you don't feel that way here. But in fact, that may be the case. Now, I was just reading a, a novel, and I came across okay, some of the disadvantages. It's messy. You can't control it, everything. Sometimes students will go off on a tangent. And I remember initially, we said, that's wonderful. It doesn't matter. We're not giving the blueprint. This is what you learn. They'll learn something else. That's still learning. Well, maybe the tangent isn't that valuable. Maybe it's not so perfect. Um, teacher can't control the direction. And students can fake interest and in learning. I read this novel, and the student, Peter's group, was ignoring him. The truth was, even when he wasn't being ignored, he didn't contribute much to group work. Group work was just a way for teachers to get another free period, <laughs> this student said. And he goes on, by this time of year, Mr. Hathaway had given up the pretense of visiting each group, listening with fake interest, and moving on. Now he just worked at his desk, scratching out illegible remarks at the bottom of each of their take-home tests from last week. When he looked up, suddenly, Peter turned back to the group and nodded. OK. This doesn't happen in our classes, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, something to think about when we talk about this is the best method, this is what we do. Let's always look very objectively and say, how can I modify it, perhaps, for some of the students? Obey. OK, technological innovations, multimodal teaching 
including the use of computers, cameras, smartphones, smartboards, have truly changed the way teachers teach and students learn. Again, any advantages? Specifically when it comes to grammar, can you think of advantages? Websites, more resources, okay. That would be not just grammar, but for all la English language learning, absolutely. You can use technology outside the classroom to practice. For practice. It encourages independence. It encourages independence. They can go at their own pace. I know that for younger students, it's engaging. Mm -hmm. For a lot of students, it's engaging. Uh, immediate feedback or assessment. Right, right, yeah. I think that, in fact, when you think of focused practice exercises, you know, computers are absolutely made for that because some students can do them very quickly, some work slowly, some can skip them because they know the answers. Really, technology is great. Plus, the biggest advantage of all is, you know, in a general grammar book, there are a lot of exercises. Who corrects them? Do you? I mean, do you take home the papers and check all their answers? No. Do the students? Sometimes they have the answers in the back of the book. Sometimes you go over them in class. But the reality is, if they can do them online, the computer corrects them, and you can get a report of how they did, it really is a natural fit. So it sounds really very, very good to me as a way for students to do focused practice. Okay, individual paced learning, and you said this, access beyond the classroom, immediate feedback, student motivation is high for some students, and students can take initiative. Disadvantages. Okay. It's very impersonal when you have to students. Of course, it's impersonal. You need to have internet access, you need to have a computer. Exactly, you need the internet access, you need the computer. Um, unreliable. Unreliable, what happens when it breaks down? But a lot of times students are just goofing off. Sometimes you like yeah. Facebook is a lot more fun than that grammar exercise, right? Uh -huh. And if you have a lab, you know if you look around, you'll inevitably see the students doing <laughs> all sorts of things other than your grammar lesson. There's not a lot of communication going on. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So it is intimidating for some of the students. We always assume that if anyone is a certain age, they take to computers, but it's not true. And I've seen that in many classes where not everyone is as, as motivated because it's on the computer. Okay, how does a communicative approach work in a grammar class? Some people would say that there are two different sides. As a matter of fact, I, I really feel I'm talking today because I know, even in my own program, there are teachers who philosophically believe in the communicative approach and feel that grammar is kind of, well, we do lip service to grammar and we do it because the students want it, but they don't think it helps. I think there are other people in my program who, in fact, feel the best way to approach grammar is you present the rule clearly in an interesting manner, and you do the practice, and let them do the communicative work at another time. I don't go along with either of those philosophies, and I very much believe in communicative grammar teaching, and I hope to try and explain why today and give you lots of examples. Okay, let's go back to 1980s. That was when Stephen Krashen went around saying, Grammar may not help and may even hurt. What happened as a result of this? <laughs> yeah, people stopped teaching grammar. But then, shortly after, many teachers continued to teach grammar. Students continued to buy grammar books. And applied linguists, classroom teachers agreed grammar is necessary and help speed the process of language learning. By the mid-90s, most people agreed, and Natalie Bailey said, uh, many cognitive psychologists have contributed to the growing consensus that form can be taught. They've pointed out the need for noticing in order for learning to take place, and the capacity for adult language learners for being active, constructive, and planful, in other words, intentional rather than 
incidental learners. And I think these are two key words because Krashen believed that people would pick up grammar incidentally, which incidentally was exactly what we used to say about vocabulary. Remember? We never focused on vocabulary. He said students will pick it up as they do a lot of reading and listening, etc. Okay, anyway, this is what we all agreed, but I, I, I found a much more interesting quote and one that I think is much more applicable to what we think about grammar. And this was Robert de Kaiser. And this is what he said. Although the applied linguistics literature of the 80s was characterized by a debate over whether or not second language instruction should make students attend to form, the vast majority of publications since the early 90s support the idea that some kind of focus on form is useful. To some extent, for some forms, for some students, at some point in the learning process. Wow, <laughs> what a way to hedge your bets, right? How come he said this? And what does that have to do with ideas today? Has anybody read Thinking Fast and Slow? OK. Daniel Kahneman wrote the book. And it's very interesting. Uh, by training, what does he do? He's, he's what? He's a psychologist. But he, in fact, won the Nobel uh, Prize for economics. And if you read the book as a language teacher, you're going to find that he's giving you a lot of insight into language learning, too. But at one point, he said the following. We understand the process of human thought much better than we once did. We're not rational calculating machines, but collections of modules, each programmed to be adroit at a particular set of tasks. Not everyone learns most effectively in the same way. And I've heard this and seen this, particularly when it comes to grammar. Uh, for many years, I've had the opportunity to speak to teachers about grammar. And I always said that I would see in my class two types of students. One I'd call scientists and the other gamblers. The scientists are the kinds of students who really feel confident if they learn the form, they learn about the language, and then they practice it. And this gives them confidence. The gamblers, on the other hand, are the type of student who want the language. They want to hear it and practice it and play around with it. And both of them can be very good language learners or not such good language learners, but they actually are quite different. Let me just ask you, think about yourself learning a language, any language. Do you see, raise your hand if you see yourself more as a scientist. Scientists, raise your hands. OK, put your hands down. If you see yourself more as a gambler, gamblers, raise your hand. OK, you've proven what I've seen over and over again. There's almost a 50-50 divide between scientists and gamblers. And to me, this is a very important message. If we're scientists, we have to respect the fact that there are gamblers. If we're gamblers, we have to respect the fact that they're scientists. And the best approach to grammar, I really believe, is a balanced approach. OK. Let's talk a little bit why people have always wanted to learn grammar. I'm sure you'll give me the reasons. So quickly, why have people wanted to learn grammar? To talk fluently? Accurately. Probably more to talk accurately. The skeleton, ah, the skeleton of the language, Diane Larson Freeman. What else? It's easier to learn the grammar than sometimes it is to learn. Sometimes it's easier because it's objective. There's a right, wrong answer. There are two things. One, our desire to make a good impression and not look bad. Uh -huh. The second thing is, I think, a, a human need to impose order on the confusing situation. Uh huh. Exactly. Very good. Other thoughts about? Why? OK. OK, maybe a lot of you have heard that Diane Larson Freeman called grammar the backbone of the language. Well, my student Miho from Japan said, 
English grammar is very important to know the language construction. I think it's like a bone of body. So similar thoughts. Uh, people like grammar because of the status. They want to belong in the right social group, and they want to know what's right and what's wrong. As you mentioned, um, there's actually a story about a British he he head waiter who had a very uncouth customer, and he said, sir, if it ever came to a show of weapons, I'd use grammar. <laughs> okay. Grammar gives you more bang for the buck. By that I mean is if you learn a pattern, you can apply it many times, many cases. If you learn a vocabulary word, it's wonderful, but you can only use that word where it belongs. But patterns of grammar are, are much more applicable. Curiosity, you mentioned people have a desire to put order, to know how something operates, the <coughs> mental curiosity. But this, I believe, is the real reason that people want to learn grammar. And it may not be the real reason, but it was my reason to teach it. Uh, when I was a uh, child, my parents had come from Vienna eight years before I was born. So they spoke German to one another, but to me they spoke English. When I was 16, I took my first trip to Europe with my parents, and I had studied French in high school, so I said, when we got to Paris, I'll do all the talking. My French was terrible, but I studied it, and I was a good student, so I knew how to speak, and I spoke with great confidence. A week later, we went to Vienna, and I actually understood German a lot better than French, because I'd heard it all the time. After a couple of attempts, I said in German, ich verstehe, kann ich nicht sprechen, I can, I can understand, but I can't speak the language, because I'd never been taught the language. I never knew that what I was saying didn't sound ridiculous or stupid or, you know, I lacked confidence. And I really think this is the reason we should give the students a grammar class. And they want to know something about the form. OK, I like to change. Oh, I'm sorry, a question in the back? Um, is there some form necessary to negotiate meaning? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes grammar is absolutely necessary for, for the purposes of understanding. There's a difference between um, I, uh, he, I've read a book, and uh, I've been reading a book. You know, there are lots of cases. I, just one came to mind. But yes, you need grammar to understand what's meant, for, clearly. But what's the problem with traditional grammar teaching? You're going to all know two out of three, at least. What's the problem with grammar? Why people don't like grammar? Boring. What's the other one? It doesn't make sense, right? Confusing and boring. OK. I disagree, actually, but that's what we say, boring. <laughs> I think that you can make it interesting. I really believe that effective teachers can take something very boring and using good tools, good methods, good ideas will make it interesting. Similarly, you said confusing. Again, I don't think that that's a reason that we you know, we should question grammar because what you have to do is give enough scaffolding. You know, I find computers, once you've learned something, you feel really wonderful. I know how to do whatever it is on the computer. But often people who know how to do something, they never give me enough scaffolding so I can get it right away. They say, oh, it's easy, you just do blah, 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 but they left out three steps. And it's the same thing with the grammar point. If you do step by step by step, it won't be confusing. But there is a problem with grammar. Isn't this true? Haven't you had students who really do very well on a focused grammar test? Turn around, give them an open-ended writing assignment, and it all is forgotten. And there's no correlation. And you feel terrible. They, they, they did so well in grammar. But OK. I strongly believe that it's our job never to stop at the focus practice, and never to see that as our goal in a grammar class, but rather 
bridging the gap between understanding the form and use of a structure and using it in open-ended ways. So I don't believe any grammar lesson should end unless you give them some open-ended speaking and writing where they're forced to use that grammar. And it can be done very effectively. Balance communication and language focus, integrate the skills, and include Alexis pronunciation, speaking, writing, and assessment component. You know, it sounds like a lot, but I remember we once had a speaker at Hunter, um, uh, Kathleen Bailey came and spoke at the program that I, I'm teaching at, and somebody asked her, what's the difference between teaching in the past and teaching today? And it happened to be, and she's talking in the winter time, and today's a good example. How, how do you stay warm in winter? Layers. Exactly. Layers. And that's the difference. There are many more layers to our teaching today. We don't just teach one thing. We try to add layers to the teaching, and that's the richness of a good class today. I think it's important to use online material to individualize grammar practice and go beyond the classroom. And always think I want to challenge, but not overwhelm. Well, okay, that's kind of the introduction. <laughs> what I'd like to do now is talk about specific activities that engage all students in a communicative grammar class without giving teachers extra work. Because I know I have an 8 o'clock class this morning, and I have another class tomorrow morning, and I, you know, I don't have that much time to prepare uh, lots of work for students at different levels. Uh, yes? Just, uh, uh, the part about uh, grammar, teaching grammar, and, uh, and getting away from boring and confusing, uh, an element that I think uh, is very important to introduce, and I hear little about it, and that is that there must be passion and emotion involved in this process because this is how our minds work. They are, the, 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 the prefrontal cortex does not operate all just by itself. I agree with you that if we can get our students to be inspired and passionate, and if we ourselves are excited and passionate, it transfers and it will be a more effective well, I'm lesson. thinking about using material that, that stimulates... Oh, I agree completely. I, I, I agree with you completely. Um, <laughs> actually, <laughs> many grammar lessons today begin with material which I know material writers hope will be engaging and interesting. Uh, and the grammar class, in many cases today, communicative grammar classes, carry out a theme. And again, we're hoping that the theme will bring in a lot of interest and, and get students excited. Um, but what I wanted to ask you about is there are many grammar books that start off with a reading where the grammar is in context, right? What do the textbooks usually do after the reading? They have a few very kind of ordinary, what? Exactly, exactly. They ask questions. Those questions are, you know, fill in the blank, true, false. Uh, they're moderately engaging. I think there's a lot more you can do with a grammar in context. How can you make them more effective? Well, I'd like to suggest some things that I've tried that I think you might find interesting. Here are examples of readings. Um, have students summarize, write two or three sentences that give you the main idea of the passage. Uh, this is for an intermediate, high intermediate student. What's the advantage of writing a summary? Do they get the point? Sure, make sure they get the point because often the questions that follow a reading don't make sure they get the point. They got a few details, but it's very important. Also, there's the carryover to their writing. They should be able to know the main idea and give a main idea in their writing. Um, but you may have students who are very weak. An alternative for the weak students is give the article a new title. It's the same idea. What's the main idea? But it's a lot easier. Okay. Has anybody heard of K. Anders Ericsson? 
He's a professor at the University of Florida who has recently done work on why people are experts at different things. But before he did that, many years before, he did research on memory. And he said, it's not genetic. You can work and train yourself to have a much better memory. And I think that we have kind of, um, we, know, we don't use the word memory when it comes to teacher training. Why not? What's the bad word, uh, idea associated with it? Rote. Yeah, exactly. Rote memorization. So we never talk about it. But how many of you think memory and remembering things is an important part of learning any new language? Yes. Of course it is. OK. So a very nice exercise, and this is one I've done with my students, is they read the passage, listen to the passage, and then they close the books. And then you say to everybody, OK, what do you remember? And then what I do is I call on all the students who, have, who remember something, and I write it on the board. If you have a stronger student, you can have the stronger student write it on the board. And then I look at what everybody has written, and we talk about it. And it's very, very interesting, because there are students who will write the main idea, students who will write details, and students who will give incorrect information. And all of this becomes evident in this exercise. It's a very, very effective way to go over a, a grammar and context reading. OK, earlier, I, I, I mentioned, or you mentioned, actually, dictations, which are now done as dictagloss. And I'd like you to not read the whole passage, but just start from scientist Dan Butner studies the lifestyle of older people in different parts of the world. As a result of his studies in Nicaragua, he offers this advice. I want you to read the advice and see if you can remember it. I know it's late in the day. You can't see it? You have to put on your glasses. OK, I'll read it to you. Eat a lot of green vegetables, fresh fruit, olive oil, fish, and Greek honey. Drink herbal tea and goat milk. Don't worry. Take naps. Walk. Don't use a car, a bus, or a train. Call friends often and pray. OK? You got it? OK. With your partner, see how many you can remember, OK? Anybody want to volunteer one? One. Eat green vegetables, fish, olive oil, and fruits. And honey. And honey. Okay, we got the eat one. What? Pray. What? Take naps. Call friends often. Don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. OK, shh, shh, shh. you don't have to do the exercise, but you have to get the idea of getting your students involved where they don't think they're doing anything with grammar, but in fact they are. And at the same time, they're picking up some vocabulary. It's a very nice, very effective exercise. Uh, write questions. This is old hat. The only thing I wanted to point out is um, I read an article about question techniques. And they're really different kinds of questions. The easiest are data recall and naming questions. And these are the kinds you usually find in your textbook. But I think it's important to get students to start asking questions of a higher level. And so that's something you can also work on. Google the topic. We all do this, and it's really a good way to get the students involved. Okay. Uh, what separates an intermediate from an advanced level EFL student, ESL student? 
there's a hint. It's on the board. OK. What they've discovered is it's not knowledge of grammar forms. Because in fact, students at different levels may know a lot about the forms. It is the richness of vocabulary. I think vocabulary cannot be separated from learning the grammar. And if you use thematic units, you'll help students learn words and groups of words that go together. And also, certain grammar structures lend themselves to vocabulary practice. I said phrasal verbs. What are some other grammar points that are really uh, you know, on the fine line of its grammar, but it's also vocabulary? Idioms. Idioms. Collocation. Well, collocations are really vocabulary. They're not exactly. But what? Prepositional Prepositions, absolutely. Comparative. Comparatives, adjectives, adverbs. These are ways you can really help students improve their vocabulary at the same time as they're doing grammar exercises. Okay, this is adverbs where you get the students to say, oh, he plays defensively, he hits powerfully, he ran fast, etc. And somebody else mentioned collocation exercises, which I also think often we talk about places. And students don't realize, you know, simple exercise like this. Give them a few nouns like traffic, pollution, rain, humidity, hospital, snow, and adjectives. And see if they put them together in the right way. Uh, students will say there was big traffic. They don't realize heavy traffic. It's very nice to do exercises and make them aware of it, and they just become more fluent and accurate. OK. Uh, incidentally, among the uh, people who wrote in what features they were looking for, one of them wrote, grammar should be taught in natural contexts. And I think you know, I would agree with that. Uh, step two, grammar presentation. We all know that you're taught two ways. Elicit rule from examples, right? The inductive learning. Or give the rule and elicit examples, right? That's pretty traditional. Everybody knows that. Um, what is the art of teaching? It's really a matter, well, <coughs> This always reminds me of the story of my friend who went to the Super Bowl. And he came there. He was a little late. And he rushed his seat. And he was shocked. The seat next to him was empty. And he looked. And there was a woman on the other side of the seat. And he said, oh, I'm surprised the seat is empty. And she said, well, it belonged to my husband. But he passed away. So the man said, oh, I'm so, so sorry to hear that he passed away. And she said, yes. And he said, but you know what? I'm still surprised that none of his friends or relatives wanted this ticket. Scalpers are getting $1,000 for a ticket. And the woman said, yes, I was surprised too. But they all wanted to attend the funeral. <laughs> Priorities. Right? <laughs> Priorities in life as well as in teaching. And this is something that nobody can say, OK, you're teaching a grammar class. There are 10 rules. Teach A, B, C, D, E. You have to know your students' needs and interests and how much they need and at what time, you know, at which time to do it. Another part of the art of teaching is always trying to teach new ways to teach. And this is something I've tried with my classes. And I think that you can try it very easily, very effectively, when you want them to show that they understand a grammar form. And you also want to get them more motivated. Use your digital camera. <laughs> what structures can you practice using a digital camera? What, what can your students show? Nouns. What? Nouns? Oh, of course, nouns. What else? What do you mean verbs? Like what Smile. verbs? Smiling. OK, you know, you can look present progressive. He's smiling, and she's you know, making the, the V sign. OK, in front of and back of. What else? 
Okay, how? <laughs> you can, but you have to figure out how, or they have to figure out how. He was hit by the car, possibly. You can have funny pictures. Like one of my students brought in uh, somebody, he, he, he showed somebody with a razor and then some ketchup. And he said, my friend was shaving when he cut himself. Past progressive with interrupted action. When your students bring in something like this, I guarantee you the rest of the class looks with great intent and remembers much more so than when you simply use the textbook and use your own examples. So I think this is a good way to work with those grammar presentations. OK, this I said before. How do you give students enough guided practice? How do you make sure they've got the right answers? How do you individualize focused practice? And I think the answer is computers. Have them do controlled grammar online. It's a natural fit if you have material that you think is good that's online. OK, and this you all know. They work at their own pace. They get instant feedback, and you can monitor their work. Any disadvantages? I'm sorry. Any disadvantages to having them work online with focused practice? Facebook. The Facebook one, if they do it in class. If they do it at home, they just give you the results. For me, I would think it's that we don't end up seeing the errors that they make unless we see like some kind of a printout at the mm -hmm. end. Right. We're not right. actually there with them seeing that then make the You're mistake. absolutely right. That is a disadvantage. They really make a certain type of mistake. You don't know where they went wrong, so you can't help them as much. Yeah. Also, the human interaction with the question. Absolutely. The human interaction can't. can't uh, OK. The final part of every grammar class, in my opinion, and the most important, the culminating part, is the open-ended. And this should include listening, pronunciation, speaking, and writing. When it comes to listening, um, I always like to say, don't waste a good listening. Uh, in the book, they usually will have a listening and then a couple of questions. But it's good for students to hear a listening more times. However, they'll be bored unless you give them a task. So the, the trick is you have a listening. You think it's very good. They've done the book work. Add some other question. Uh, it could be, uh, I don't know, whatever it has to do with listening. How did the woman sound? Did she sound angry? Did she sound sarcastic? Uh, what did you think of what she said? Anything that gets them to listen carefully and come back with an answer. Pronunciation. OK. Uh, just one tr thing that I like to do when I have a pronunciation class, I like students to exaggerate the pronunciation, and I exaggerate the pronunciation. This works particularly well if you have a young group of students. And I was teaching a group of French students from the university. They were engineering students. They were in a summer program. And they really were not interested in sounding too American. So what I did with them is I had them exaggerate the ah sound, you know, the ah, the ugly sound. And then they liked doing it because it sounded almost funny. And they sounded better and better and better. So when it comes to a pronunciation exercise, get them to exaggerate. Get them to try to sound as American as they can. And I think they'll take to it more readily. OK. Open-ended speaking and writing should be the culminating activity in every grammar class. Some popular communicative activities are problem solving, like values clarification. A classmate wants to see, a classmate who's your friend wants to see your answers during a test. Okay. What kind of grammar structure can you pr practice with such problems? What's a natural st in the back? Conditionals, exactly. What would you do if you were, you know, this person? Um, do you like problem-solving activities? 
I think they're very, very good. I think they're better than some of the others, like find someone who. Absolutely, and that makes it very interesting because, you know, I wouldn't let my classmate and friend see the answers. It's wrong to cheat. I absolutely believe that. In another case, my friend is more important than the answers to the test. I would certainly show my friend the answers. And they get into a discussion, and they really, really enjoy that and get a lot out of it. Um, find someone who. I used one today in class, and I thought to myself, this isn't such a wonderful exercise. At first, we all said, oh, they're wonderful, right? But there's something a little stale about them, and very sentence, discrete sentence. Maybe for the lower levels, they're OK. But as students get more advanced, it's, it, it, it does allow you to have them question different ten use different tenses. But as far as the most exciting, I don't know. How about games like trivia? What's, what structure is trivia games good for? Trivia? Students write these questions. What, can, what, what kind of questions? Yes, the all WH questions, but more specifically, what can you do with a trivia game that's fun for students and good grammar practice? Hmm? Yeah, I, I think so. That's what I've done with my students. Usually works very well, you know, especially they can check on, on their phones what's the highest mountain in the United States, what's the smallest state in the States, what's the biggest river in the world. It's a nice natural way to talk about geography and also practice the superlatives. And I think it does work well. I love who's telling the truth. Have you played that with your students? OK. Who's telling the truth? The students at all levels seem to enjoy. I don't want to do it with you because you know, it just take too much time. But three people stand up and say they've done something. I went to Kyoto last summer. I went to Kyoto last summer. I went to Kyoto last summer. And even at basic levels, they can somehow ask questions. And at the more advanced levels, everybody participates and loves doing it. So I highly recommend this as a very enjoyable, very interactive activity where you can step back, they take over, and everyone wants to have a chance. Role plays are very nice because sometimes students don't want to get so personal. And they like the idea of pretending to be somebody that they aren't at the same time as they're practicing particular grammar points. Find the differences. We traditionally do this with something simple like present progressive. It's fun. Students look at two pictures and say, OK, in this picture, he's eating, he's cooking hot dogs. But in the other picture, he's, what is he doing? He's grilling chicken or barbecuing chicken. Uh, but you can also do it with phrasal verbs on a higher level. Um, she took the curtains down. She straightened up the room. She threw out the uh, garbage. She hung up the picture. It's a very good way to elicit phrasal verbs. And if you have a good picture, it's very nice. It's also Sometimes uh, you can just look and compare. Sometimes you have students sitting back to back and comparing pictures. OK, another, <laughs> another um, activity that's great is having students study a picture. Always remember your students' visual ability is not hampered by their language ability. And you have them look at a picture, write down all they remember about it, and then tell the class, listen to their descriptions. I mean, this is not from a textbook. This was from a magazine I had. If you look at it, study it for a while. What do you remember about it? A red shirt? Red shirt, yellow, yellow dress. 
a yellow something in the back. She's clasping her hands, holding her hands. Long hair, smiling. OK, the beautiful part of an exercise like this is when you're put on the spot, you say, wow, I looked at it, but I really didn't notice it that much. And you listen to your classmates, and everybody contributes a little bit. And then you simply go back. Sorry. And you let the students look again. And suddenly, I'm sure all of you are looking much more carefully now, aren't you? Aren't you looking and finding a lot more? So if you do this with your students, you'll help them become better observers, more aware. And you can do this with anything. This is a French Forbes magazine. Woman is a big businesswoman. OK. The final activity, I believe, in every grammar class should be writing. Uh, doesn't have to be long essays as a traditional writing class, but a paragraph in which you use the focus of that particular lesson. And I think the best way to make sure students do it in each, you know, for each unit is have them underline the grammar that they have used in the paragraph. And also, it's a nice idea to have them go back and have a checklist of anything you've taught them about writing, whether you've taught them transition words or uh, certain organizational patterns or a main idea or a detail. And in a checklist, write down all those different features and say, have you uh, written a main idea? Have you given details? Have you started with a capital lever? Have you indented? Whatever you've taught them, have a checklist. But this is the final point I want to make, and this is something I've done and will involve some work, but I do believe it's worth it. Question. After you've returned a piece of writing with your corrections, suggestions, how do you know that the students that the student has understood and learned from your comments? How do you know? What? Yeah, they write it again. That's the writing process. The two, three uh, versions. But how do you know they've actually learned from your comments? I mean, Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Peer correction. Yeah. Peer correction. Let's just say in a future writing assignment, if they're making the same errors, then. OK. You're on to what I started to do. And I'd like to suggest that you try it. Make a copy of their uncorrected papers. It involves Xeroxing. And after students have received the papers with your suggestions, and corrections and revive, revise their papers, give them their original paper as an individual test. In other words, we all do the writing process, but I don't believe students have learned what we've done. And I hate correcting papers for me. I, I don't want to correct it. I know, I know what's correct. I want them to learn from it. And I feel that this is one way you'll really make them aware that they've got to study what you've said or suggested and learn from it, because that's going to be their final test. Um, now, another way, an alternative way, and this is a little bit easier, and you might want to try this, is you choose sentences with errors from their papers and have them correct those errors. So you realize everybody gets an individual test. And yes, it does take a little bit of time. But I honestly believe that if the students realize that those papers that have been marked are going to be part of their final test, they'll get a lot more out of your writing. Would you take that another step and actually make that a class exercise? Pull a sentence, put it up on the Oh, board. this we've done. Yeah. Everybody does this. This we do all the time. We take their errors, and we have error correction. And I test them on the error corrections. But I feel more than that,
to make them feel it's individualized learning. I take their papers, because students are at different levels. You know, Penny Ur said, a heterogeneous class is a class of more than one student. I take their papers, and you know, I'll take one paragraph, and I'll, you know, from the Xerox, and I'll say, this is your final exam, this is your final exam. It's not the only final exam, but it's one part of it. And I think at least you should try it out to have the satisfaction that I didn't work hard correcting papers or writing suggestions, and they ignored it. Okay. Final, yes. You know, they say for a vocabulary word, to learn a word, you need to hear it seven times. I feel for a grammar point, maybe it's 14 <laughs> times. Absolutely. And that came, oh, you fit in. I, you were planted to my final two suggestions. One was ask, don't tell, and the other was constantly review. Anyway, uh, these are the final two suggestions. Whenever possible, ask a question rather than tell them something. And don't forget to review. You know, we tend to go on and on and on, and we forget that we should kind of review what we did before. <coughs> Sometimes students will say, I don't know, it's so hard. Why do I need to learn a foreign language? And this is what you have to tell them. The story of the mother cat and her baby kittens. It was a beautiful day, and the mother cat said, come on, take a walk, you little kittens, take a walk. It's a beautiful day. And the little kitten said, meow, meow, OK. Three little kittens took a walk. One block later, what happens? You know it. There's a big dog there. And the dog looks at the three baby kittens, and the dog goes, Ruff, ruff, and they run back to the mother cat. And the mother cat says, hey, what's going on? I told you to go take a walk. It's a beautiful day. And the kitten said, meow, meow, we got scared. There was a big dog. He barked at us. And the mother cat looked at her baby kittens, and she said, come with me. <laughs> so the mother cat goes, and the little kittens follow, meow, 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 meow. Sure enough, the same dog, one block further, uh, later. And the dog pulls himself up, looks at the mother cat, and the dog goes, ruff, ruff. And the mother cat turns to the baby kittens and said, watch me. And she turns to the dog, and she goes, ruff, ruff. The dog goes away. And the mother cat turns to the baby kittens and says, that's why I told you to learn another language. <laughs> OK, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Irene, for a wonderful talk. Very <laughs> inspirational. And we're going to open the door to the floor to questions uh, because we're taping this. Uh, when you, if you have a question, raise your hand, and either my colleague or I will pass the mic. I'm sorry, just for clarification purposes. When you were saying to give them their own writing back as a test, so you give them a Xerox and you tell them, correct the errors yes. in this yes. writing? Yes. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Exactly. just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Any other questions? There's a strong emphasis on technology. I teach adults ages 20 through 70. And once they're over 40, they're not interested in computers. Computers are available to them. They're not interested in computers. How do you get over that hump? I think, basically, I think the answer is they will be interested when they're <laughs> capable, when they're able to do things. In other words, scaffold it. Let them do something very simple with the computer. Show them that they can do the exercise. Give them the satisfaction of seeing that it works. Maybe they, even, they won't like it even when they can do it. But my guess is they'll be intrigued enough to become more involved in it. 
And if not, we have to respect who they are and realize we want to meet their, their needs, their interests. Hi. Uh, my students love to listen to music, so I was wondering, like, have you ever used music to teach grammar? If you have, what suggestions do you have? Do you know of any resources that's available for us that we don't just have to, like, you know, okay. pick any song out there and figure out a lesson plan? I actually it? had some fantastic lessons. I mean, this is, I, I remember years ago, I said, you can bring in a song that has one of the structures we've learned. And they all brought in different songs. They had the words. Many cases, we showed them the difference between the spoken language and the written language. And it's wonderful. And they were singing the songs, listening. It's, it's a great lesson. I, I, I love it. They loved it. And I, I think it, it works very well. Um, sometimes in one group, we have two different kinds of students. One kind is that they have very solid educational background in their native language. They know what structure is. Another group, no clue what a noun is. How do you handle that? <laughs> How do you handle that? OK. I think that if you have the kind of textbook where they can focus on form and read the meta language, understand it and get helped by that, they can do that. And for the other students who are really so far behind, I would just let them do the exercises as best they can and see if they can get some information some of the time. I think the important thing is to respect the fact that there are different heights of students and th there should be different kinds of approaches and lessons within any lesson. Yeah. One more question. Thank you. Um, most students I have had so far have some sort of fossilized language issues. And I was wondering, you know, um, a lot of the approaches you talked about, whether they work for that as well. Okay. Fossilized language learners need more of a focus on form often than the communication practice. You know, I think a lot of the students we have in my program need much more open-ended communication practice because they, in fact, have studied the form in their country. But there's another type of student who's rather fluent and speaks fossilized English. And those students need classwork where the focus is on the form. They need much more correction in class. They have to be taught when they make a mistake, he don't do it. What was that? What was that? Till they give you, he doesn't do it. And I think that that's the way to handle that type of student. And yes, there are different approaches for the fossilized student and the student who, who's very shy about speaking because they haven't had, they've never been surrounded by English. OK, just one thing before I go. I mentioned to you that I had asked, uh, uh, I had asked the questions, the early bird questions, to a group of uh, directors and program administrators last year, and I think maybe you thought of them, and I thought I'd just to go through the things that they thought were important. Grammar should be taught in natural contexts. Under grammar presentation, someone wrote clarity of instruction, a distinction made between spoken and written English, creative presentation of grammar in which students notice important features of the structure, under communication practice, real-world tasks, good communicative activities, scaffolded instruction, guided to open-ended, good management of pairs, groups, and whole class, a variety of tasks and activities. And then they mentioned things that don't fall into either of those categories, but they said teachers must know the material very well, which means really know the grammar, and that's a whole different area. Teachers should have good control, which is very different from good discipline. Uh, teachers should address a variety of learning styles. All four skills should be practiced in the grammar class. There should be incorporation of technology, if possible. There should be clear objectives, high expectations for all students, and the objectives should be met. That was it. OK, again, you've been a fabulous audience. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you very much, Irene.